In this lecture, we're going to focus on data cleaning. Now, data cleaning is an important part of the data management process. So once we've acquired our data, it's important to do the following. First, we want to identify data entry errors and inconsistent coding. Then we want to evaluate the extent to which we have missing data or data missingness. Then we want to identify out-of-bounds values or scores that we might have. Next, address open-ended other responses or those responses where people are writing in their qualitative responses. What are you going to do with those? How are you going to code those? Are you going to use those responses? And then finally, you want to focus on flagging any untrustworthy variables that you might have. Those are variables that have such great concerns or such unclean data that you don't think you can actually rectify or clean that up. And for that reason, you might decide not to proceed forward with any type of data analysis involving those untrustworthy variables. So let's look at some examples of how we can clean by addressing these different aspects of data cleaning. Okay, let's start with those data entry errors. So here we see a table that includes employee data. And so we have employee ID is the left-hand column, facility is the middle column, and start date is the start date for these employees. So each row represents a unique employee's data. And in this case, let's start with facility here. You can see with the facility variable or column that we have Beaverton and Portland location. So there's two different levels that we can see here for this facility, Beaverton and Portland. However, in reality, we have four different levels. And you might be asking four, but we only have Beaverton and Portland. Well, the reality is, is that Beaverton is spelled two different ways, as well as in one instance, it has a capital B. And so you'll see that at the very top, we have Beaverton spelled with a capital B. Just below that, the next entry, we have Beaverton with a lowercase b. And then if you look all the way towards the bottom, you'll see Beaverton that is misspelled. Now, most systems and data analysis packages will recognize these as three separate levels because they do have different case sensitivities. They do have different cases for the first letter as well as two different spellings. And so again, you would find that there are four different levels for this variable. So you'd want to go through and clean this up by creating some kind of standardized validated entry for the Beaverton facility and whatever other facilities might have similar issues. Now, one quick way that you can do this is by running frequency or counts for this particular variable. And usually that would jump out because you would see that there are four different levels that have associated frequencies with them when you run a count or frequency analysis. Now, let's consider when we evaluate missing data as part of the data cleaning process. So let's take a look at this facility variable again. And notice that we have two empty entries here for two different employees. So they are missing the information for the facility. Now, this is the point at which you want to understand, is it that they are missing this data because someone forgot to enter the data and perhaps you need to go find whomever that was or find other records that would indicate where this employee is currently working in terms of the facility? Or is it they truly don't have a value or level or score for that particular variable? Those are two different things. And now if it's the latter, you'll need to think about what do you do with those people for subsequent analysis? Do you keep them in if they don't have a score for this facility? Or do you kick them out or treat them as outliers, perhaps people that have very distinct data and maybe there's a very good explanation for why they don't have a facility recorded for them and that makes them unlike the other people that are in this particular sample. So now let's consider out of bounds values and what we do with those in terms of data cleaning and how we recognize those. So let's take a look at base salary here. So this is a new table we have where now we have the base salary and the tenure in years for different employees. And notice in the base salary column or variable that we have your standard salaries ranging from 54,310 to $55,541 in the very last row. But do note that we do have one entry here that is for 789,120,000. Now, Based on what you know about the company, this might be either just an outlier, perhaps this is just a really well-paid CEO, or perhaps more than likely, this is a data entry error. And so you'll notice that there's a number of zeros at the end of this, and it could be that this is really supposed to be 78,912, but someone added on four, four zeros by mistake when entering the data. So this would be something you'd wanna go through and clean up. Now, let's take a look at the tenure variable here. So this is tenure in years. And so notice through here, we have pretty standard values for tenure in years, two and a half years, half a year of employment, three and a half years, and so forth. But notice we have one value that is circled here that is negative 9,999. 
Now, it's probably unlikely that someone has negative years of tenure. And so what this is, perhaps, is that some people choose to code missing values, so when someone has missing data, as a negative 9999 or a negative 99 or something like that, just to flag it as being very, very apparent. Now, this can be very problematic because if you were going to calculate the mean number of years of tenure for this sample of people, of course, this negative 9,999 would be included in that. Now, some statistical software programs will actually allow you to code these such that it'll treat the negative 9,999 variable or whatever you, you code as missing as a missing value and won't include it in subsequent descriptive and inferential statistics that you run. Now in this case, let's assume we don't have that in place, so we would want to make sure that we delete this or perhaps put whatever missing value code is applicable. Some packages, some software such as R use the NA and that is going to represent a missing value. Okay, so this is another thing we want to consider here is looking for these out of bounds values. This is another great example where frequencies can come into play and running counts on variables. So any type of count or frequency would definitely show you these as being outliers and it would draw your attention to them because you could see that there's this steady progression or natural range that you would expect and then in a very extreme, maybe implausible value. So now let's consider what we do during data cleaning with those open-ended other responses. So sometimes you might have, let's say during an employee survey where you, it's completely anonymous so you don't know who exactly is responding but you want to know some key information about them, you might include an other response that's kind of a bailout response if something doesn't seem applicable to someone when they're responding to the survey and then they can write in whatever their particular response is to explain what their individual situation is. So in this data table, we have the survey numbers. So these are seven different surveys that were administered. And then one of the survey questions, let's assume, is what is the number of direct reports that you have as a supervisor? And so you can see that some people have three direct reports. Some people have, one person has up to 11. Now notice there are two other entries. And so what this would do typically in a survey is that someone would then click on other and it would branch them to an open-ended box where they could then write in a more specific response that explains their individual unique situation. And so you'll notice what those individual responses are in that third column which says number of direct reports and in parentheses other. And so here you'll notice that the first person who put other wrote not a supervisor. So maybe they received this, super, this survey by mistake. This was maybe intended for just supervisors but for whatever reason they got it. So then you'd have to decide well, is it appropriate to delete this person from this data set as they aren't a supervisor? And what we're interested perhaps with this survey is supervisor behavior, supervisor perceptions, attitudes, and so forth. Now the second other response, this person wrote in dotted line supervisor of three employees. Well, this gets a little bit tricky because this isn't a solid line relationship here, so to speak. So the others are implying that these are their actual direct reports or the numbers of direct reports. Now this person is saying that the dotted line supervisor of three employees, how are you going to treat this? Well, this is where you need to focus on what are your goals for this date, subsequent data analysis that's gonna come from this survey. What is your sample and what are the parameters of that sample? So, and specifically, what is the underlying population that you're interested in and who are you going to include in that sample? And so think very carefully about this because these types of people might be able to fit into your data analysis, or they might actually be unlike the others, and they might not be a part of that focal population that you've defined. So again, think very carefully about how you treat open-ended other responses. Now, let's talk about untrustworthy variables. So these are those rare instances, well, I shouldn't say rare, some, depending on the quality of your data acquisition process, you might have a lot of untrustworthy variables. This is particularly problematic sometimes in poorly designed surveys where you don't know exactly what you're getting, or if you haven't trained people on how to enter data into your information system, this can become pretty problematic. So let's look at this table here. Here we have three columns. We have the employee ID column, a completed training column, where let's assume you either complete the training, which is yes, or you don't complete the training, which is no. And then we have a training post-test column here, and this is the score that someone received on the training post-test. 
Now, take a look here at this first column, or this, this completed training column here. Notice that every single response is no. No one completed the training. Now, if you know, however, based on your experience, that definitely employees were completing the training, then this is going to likely be some type of data entry error. So it means for the time being, you probably can't use this variable for any subsequent analysis, as it's just not accurate in terms of the data it contains. So instead, you'll need to find, is there any other type of paper record or other type of documentation that we can use to identify who completed the training or not? So what likely happened is maybe this is the default setting in the system, is that everybody automatically gets a no, and then it gets replaced with a yes when there is some kind of verification or adjustment to the data table that they, in fact, did complete that training. Now, let's take a look at the third column, which is that training post-test. Now, here we have a big issue with missing data. And sometimes when data missingness is too problematic, we might have to decide to forego using that untrustworthy variable. That is, the variable becomes untrustworthy because we just don't have enough responses for it, enough values, enough scores for that particular variable. Here we see that only one employee has a score, and that's a score of 99, but we don't have any other data for the other employees. Now, this is not going to be useful for us here because we don't have any variability here. And we would assume that if someone it has completed the training, that they should have completed a training post-test, or at least you'd hope they have. So in this instance, too, we see that there's a discrepancy. So we see also that in that completed training column for that person, it says they did not complete the training, yet somehow they completed a training post-test. Again, these information, this bits of information and this constellation of decision-making strategies that you're applying here are going to help you understand and identify which variables are untrustworthy and which ones are trustworthy. And so this is a really important step because, again, we have to think about the overarching purpose of data cleaning is to make sure that we have good data to manage. It's just back to that old idea of garbage in, garbage out. If we include untrustworthy variables or dirty data into our analysis or data management processes, we're just going to get garbage data, garbage variables out on the other side. So we want to think very, very carefully about how we clean the data. Now, in terms of data cleaning steps, here's what I recommend. One of the best things to use to, as your first step is to use what many people would call the ocular test, which simply means use your own eyeballs and scan the raw data with your eyes. Look through the data tables and so forth. Sometimes things will jump out and you'll see patterns perhaps, or at least indication of something you should dive deeper into using some of the subsequent data cleaning steps. Now the second step is to run descriptive statistics. Now I've already mentioned the value of running frequencies and counts, but in addition you can run means as well to understand, okay, are these data are they conforming to our expectations? Or does it seem that there's maybe outliers we should be concerned with or just invalid entries into the data table itself? Now, the third step is to create data visualizations. And this can really go hand in hand with that second step of running descriptive statistics because data visualizations are a great way to see whether or not there are realistic values and the quality of the data and, again, whether they conform to your expectations or not. And so, for instance, a box plot can be a great way for identifying extreme values that might be implausible or that might have been just simply errors in terms of data entry. Now, the fourth step in data cleaning is to talk to subject matter experts. Before you go about entering new data, cleaning things up, it's important to talk to the person that A, maybe entered those data in the first place, or B, talk to people that know a lot about that particular context and can, can help explain what is a realistic value here, or maybe explain, did they see people complete this training? Maybe they were the trainer themselves and they can attest to the fact and even have a list or a roster of people who, complete, uh, who completed it, and they can help you then update and make more accurate data entry. Now, the fifth step is going to be to document every single decision, no matter how minor you think it is. Leave a paper trail here. And I always recommend, as far as the sixth step goes, is retain the original raw data files. And so some data analysis software, such as R, are great for this. You don't actually do anything to the raw data file. You're manipulating everything in the R environment itself. And so that way, you can always have that unaltered original form of the data. And then as you're working through writing a script, 
for data management, data cleaning, and so forth, you can actually annotate and document the different decisions that you've made along the way in terms of cleaning up the data, eliminating outliers, and things like that. Okay, so this wraps up the lecture on data cleaning. Again, data cleaning is an important aspect of the data management phase. Thank you.